All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. It's uh, two minutes after, so welcome, especially if this is your first time. We're glad you're here. We're <coughs> closing in on the last few chapters of the book of Joshua that we've been in since the beginning of the year. You have to excuse me, I'm still getting over the bug that I picked up last week. So <coughs> if I cough or snort or sneeze, just bear with it. I'll edit it out of the audio, hopefully. But um, uh, so the plan is, fingers crossed, uh, we should finish Joshua by the end of this month, or by the end of June. Is it June yet? No, it's May. We should finish Joshua by the end of June. Um, and if that's the case, then we're going to take July off. I'm going to be out of town for a couple of weeks anyway. Um, and just rather than trying to do odd lessons here and there while still trying to gear up for judges, <coughs> it's just going to be easier to probably just take the month off. Um, I'll confirm that before we make it final. If we don't take July off, then the July sessions, uh, I will be gone for probably two of them, and the other two will just be random one-offs. So I'll let you know either way. Um, but we will start judges in either August, or we may do uh, a couple, of, like a, we, may, we may do something else in August and then start judges in the fall. I'll let you know. I haven't worked it out yet. I will keep you abreast of the situation, for sure. I, <laughs> you're just happy to be here. We're in your Golden State gear. I would never have guessed you're a fan. <laughs> <coughs> um, one thing to mention too, I, I, can I do an email list? Yes. Do I have time to organize it and collate it? No. Um, <laughs> if someone wants to take that upon themselves and be the coordinator for it, that'd be awesome. Uh, we tried it in the past, never really gained a lot of steam. So, um, but I will post, uh, if you're on Facebook, I post on Facebook whenever we're not going to have, so follow me on there, uh, or follow Disciple Dojo on Facebook, even more important. Speaking of Disciple Dojo, that is the umbrella ministry under which this teaching operates. Bruce Chris provides the place and the food. Disciple Dojo provides the content in addition to other teaching ministry that we do outside of this, video, audio, podcast, refugee outreach, um, I just did a hospital visit today, like all kinds of different things. So in order, um, we're entirely funded by donors. And if you are interested, if you like the ministry, if you like this study, please go to DiscipleDojo.org. There's a big donate button right at the top. And you can the, the coolest thing you can do is sign up to earn your belt. We use a martial arts strategy. So you want to be a white belt in Disciple Dojo? That's $10 a month. $10 a month, you're a white belt supporter. If you want to be a black belt supporter, that's $100 a month. If you want to be a red belt supporter, that's $1,000 a month. I don't have any of those. But the whole purpose is that you don't actually get a belt, so um, sorry, you don't learn any martial arts. But you learn spiritual jiu-jitsu, which is just as good as regular. The whole purpose, though, monthly donors really help us as an organization um, do things like budgeting and knowing if I'm going to have a salary or not and all the kind of things that nonprofits rely on. So, but you can also do one-time gifts. If you, don't, if you live paycheck to paycheck, you know, sometimes you may get a gift and you want to give. It's entirely tax deductible. I don't see any of it, and I don't see who gives anything. We've set it up so it, it goes through the finance director on the board. I'm not in charge of taking money, receiving money. I just I get my paycheck from him based on what income we have, and I, God uses the rest to help me live. So if you're interested, if you want to support the ministry, um, you know, squeaky wheels get the grease. So I'm squeaking right now over the summer donations dip. So Disciple Dojo needs your support to continue this ministry that we've been doing for, what, six years now uh, with you guys? Uh, so I really appreciate it. If you have any questions, ask me. If you have any questions about the finances, the tax information, any of that kind of stuff, go to DiscipleDojo.org, click the contact, and you can be in touch with, um, with our finance guy who handles everything, including all of our taxes. We want to keep everything above board, so that's why I have nothing to do with the money. Um, I also don't treat people differently. If you're a big donor, I'm not going to treat you nicer than I would treat somebody who doesn't give anything. Uh, that We just do it that way intentionally. So 
Let's get back into Joshua. We're in <clears throat> chapter 18. Now, four of the tribes have gotten their land divvied up, as we've seen the past few weeks. Uh, but there's still seven tribes left that have not received their land. Now, when I say receive the land, remember where we are in Joshua. The first half of the book of Joshua, they conquered the land. That does not mean that they occupied the land. That doesn't mean that they drove out every person in the land or that every person fled or that the towns are ready. It doesn't mean any of that. It just means that the battles of the armies who opposed Israel and who, who were the, the, the guardians of Canaan, the Canaanite armies, the warlords, they're gone. Joshua won the military battles. Now it's up to Israel to live out what has already been won for them. And there's the theology of Joshua that's going to carry through in Judges and all the way into the New Testament. You know, when Paul says, work out your own salvation for it's Christ who works within you. The entirety of Christian ethics is based on living out and appropriating the victory that's already been won on the cross. That whole concept is what permeates the book of Joshua. Named Joshua, coincidentally, which is the word Jesus in Greek. And so the book of Jesus, the book of Joshua, the book of Yeshua, is, tells the story of, of Joshua, Jesus 1.0 as we call him, winning the battles, being victorious, being faithful, delivering Israel's victories, and then empowering and encouraging Israel. Now, you go forward in the same obedience and take, appropriate, what God has already given you. That's the paradox of, of much of biblical theology is, is there's that you know, human responsibility versus divine responsibility. And if you're Arminian, you want to say, well, it's all humanity's doing. We choose. If you're Calvinist, that is anathema. And you want to say, we have no choice. It's Jesus who did it all. The Bible doesn't really, isn't really huge on either of those alternatives. Um, it holds both up and says, no, no, no. God is ultimately sovereign. He did win the battle. He did redeem you. He did free you. He brought you out of Egypt. But you had to make the choice of whether you were going to be part of that or not. There's, there's divine sovereignty and human responsibility. And there are ways that theologians have tried to mesh those personally. If you're into that and you're a theology buff and you want to look into it, I think the best answer to the traditional Calvinist versus free will, Presbyterian versus Baptist versus Methodist versus whatever. The best approach I've seen is called corporate solidarity or corporate salvation or sometimes called communal sovereignty. And it's the communal view, which is everything that we see in the Old Testament, that God does the sovereign winning of the battle and freeing of the slave, but each individual corporately, but each individual has to decide for themselves whether they will receive that and walk in that or whether they'll reject it and turn away. So both personal choice and divine sovereignty are upheld in, when we look at the Bible communally through the lens of peoples first as the sovereign chosen and then individuals as God saying, now you choose who you're going to serve. We've talked about this before in Numbers. We've talked about this all the way back to Genesis, but, but it's something that can get lost. So your favorite preacher preaches a really good sermon on predestination, or you read a John Piper book and you get real fired up about predestination. Well, there's more to it than that in the Old Testament. Or you read something by, I don't know, Dave Hunt or whoever, big time Arminian, and, um, and, and just how, about how Calvinism is heretical, blah, blah, blah. Whatever. We choose our sides, our tribes, our allegiances, our theologies, the best thing is to do what we're doing, which is reading through Scripture and, and in looking at, in light of what Scripture is saying, how do all these systems fit? And what you find out, my professor in seminary, Doug Stewart, he said, um, what systematic theologies try to do is make all of this fit into a nice system, a nice grid, a nice package. But when you start reading the Bible, every now and then something will pop up something will just pop out that doesn't fit the theology. And so you go and you push that back down theologically with, through some interpretive creativity, and then something else pops up. And you go and push that, and it becomes theological whack-a-mole. And 
Rather, let Scripture say what it says and let our theology have loose ends and let our theology have questions that we don't quite leave answered. That we still ask and we still search and we still work out. That means you can't know anything. Certainly doesn't mean theology is not important. Oh my gosh, that's an anathema to the cause of Christ. When people just say, I don't need theology, just give me Jesus. Jesus is like, I am theology. Theology means talking about God. Anything you say about God is theology. So let's, let's banish that from our thinking forever. Theology does matter. But systems of theology don't always fit with the biblical story overall that we get. And so we need to be ready to hold this with our tight grip and our systematic theologies or our church denominational traditions hold those a little looser and examine those in light of Scripture rather than reading Scripture in light of our tradition. And there's so many examples we can use. I only use predestination and free will because the Joshua gives that account. The first half, God's winning all the battles and doing everything, but Israel has to freely participate in it. They can't not participate. They can't choose to not do it. And, and God will say, choose this day whom you will serve. There is legitimate choice. God doesn't just override, even, even in His sovereignty. So beware of preachers who emphasize one over the other to a greater degree. Their books sell more. They may have bigger audiences and wider broadcast networks, but just beware. Weigh everything in light of Scripture and then come to your own conclusions. But what's happened in Joshua 18 in particular, is now we've got seven tribes left that, don't, that haven't appropriated the land that's been given. So, the whole assembly of the Israelites gathered at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. Shiloh becomes now, they were at Gilgal, which is kind of on the outskirts near Jericho. <clears throat> now they've moved a little further north, a little more inward, and Shiloh becomes the place where the tabernacle is going to be set up relatively permanently. And that's going to be the center of Israel's religious life until Jerusalem is captured and David takes it and the temple's built and Jerusalem becomes the center. But that's centuries away right now. So for now, Shiloh is the place where God has chosen to make His name dwell in the tent, in the tabernacle. So they set up the tent of meeting there. The country was brought under the, their control but there were still seven Israelite tribes who had not yet received their inheritance. So Joshua said to the Israelites, how long will you wait before you take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you? In other words, what are you waiting for? We've won these battles. Why are you hanging around Shiloh? Yeah, it's great. It's, we're here at the tent, the tabernacle. But your land is waiting for you. Go, take it. Appoint three men from each tribe. I'll send them out to make a survey of the land and to write a description of it according to the inheritance of each. Then they'll return to me. You'll divide the land into seven parts. Judah is to remain in its territory on the south, and the house of Joseph in its territory on the north. Those are the two, sort of three tribes that we've already seen that have gotten their inheritance. After you've written description of the seven parts of the lands, bring them me. I will cast lots for you in the presence of the Lord. The Levites, however, do not get a portion among you because the priestly service of the Lord is their inheritance. And Gad and Reuben and the half tribe of Manasseh have already received their inheritance on the east side of the Jordan. Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave it to them. So Gad, Reuben, and half of Joseph's guys, they don't, they've already gotten their land. They're set. And Judah's already gotten their land. They're set. And the other Manasseh, tribe, part of the Manasseh tribe has gotten their land, so they're set. So the, and the Levites don't get any land. They get cities because their land is the Lord's service. So we've got these seven tribes left. As the men started on their way to map out the land, Joshua instructed them, go and make a survey of the land and write a description of it and then return to me. I will cast lots for you here at Shiloh in the presence of the Lord. So the men left and went through the land. They wrote its description on a scroll town by town in seven parts. And they returned to Joshua in the camp at Shiloh. Joshua then cast lots for them in Shiloh in the presence of the Lord, and there he distributed the land to the Israelites according to their tribal divisions. So again, this, we see this human responsibility. They go, they scout out the land, they divide the land up into the sections, and then these are the seven strips of land, pieces of land, areas of land that are left, but come back 
And God is going to sovereignly choose who gets what. That's what the giving of lots is. Casting lots is putting the decision in God's hands. So Joshua doesn't pick, oh, I like this tribe better. They get the better land. Oh, I like this, this tribe smaller. They don't get the... There's, there's little of that. There's the Lord deciding of the remaining tribes who gets what. So there's, again, it's this synergist, says synergism between God and between the people. So it begins... Verse 11, the lot came up for the tribe of Benjamin. Clan by clan, their allotted territory lay between the tribes of Judah and Joseph. On the north side of their boundary began at the Jordan, past the northern slope of Jericho, and headed west into the hill country, coming out at the desert of Beth Avon. From there, across the south slope of Luz, that is Bethel, went down to Azeroth Adar, on the hill south of lower Beth Horon. From the hill facing Beth Horon, on the south boundary, turned along the western side and came out of Kiriath Baal, that is Kiriath Yarim a town of people of Judah. This was the western side. This is doing just what the previous chapters have done. It is giving now each tribe, even the smaller ones, they're getting their own little Google map view. They're getting their own little, this are, these are the boundaries of your land. North, south, east, west. Uh, the southern side uh, began at the outskirts of Kiriath Jairim on the west, and the boundary came out at the springs of the waters of Nantoa. The boundary went down to the foot of the hill facing the valley of ben Hinnom. that's Gehenna, that's hell. North valley of, of Rephaim, it continued down the Hinnom Valley along the southern slope of the Jebusite city, that's Jerusalem. So on to Enrogel. Then it curved north, went into En Shemesh, continued to Gelioth, which faces the pass of Adamum, and ran down to the stone of Bohan, son of Reuben. It continued to the north slope of Beth Arba and down onto the Arba, and then went the northern slope of Beth Hagla down at the northern bay of the Salt Sea, the mouth of the Jordan in the south. This was the southern boundary. The Jordan formed the boundary on the east side. These were the boundaries that marked out the inheritance of the clans of Benjamin on all sides. The tribe of Benjamin, clan by clan, had the following city. So this is the city. Now within that traced line of names that mean nothing to most of us because we haven't been there, we don't have a visual understanding of the geography, but this is basically in and around Jerusalem going over to the Dead Sea, down to the Dead Sea, up to the Jordan, and back over. So that territory is generally, these are the city, the villages that are listed. Jericho, Beth Hogla, Emek, Kaziz, Beth Arba, Zamarim, Bethel, Avim, Para, Ophra, Kefir, Ammoni, Ophni, and Geba. Twelve towns in their villages. Gibeon, Rama, Beiroth, Mizpah, Kephirah, Moza, Erechim, Irpil, Tarala, Zela, Hafela, the Jebusite city, that is Jerusalem, Gibeah, and Kiriath, 14 towns and their villages. This was the inheritance of Benjamin for its clans. So this is a chunk of real estate right dead in the middle, bordering Judah, which is in the south. Jerusalem's kind of the borderline between Judah and Benjamin. It's kind of in both territories, but it's still controlled by the Jebusites at this point. It will not get captured until the time of King David. So Benjamin gets their land. Now, next, chapter 19, and we won't read through all of these because we want to get to the end of it, but just, uh, <clears throat> just so you get it, the next one that comes is, is a one that's worth pointing out. The second lot came out for the tribe of Simeon, clan by clan. Their inheritance lay within the territory of Judah. It included Beersheba, way down in the south, uh, Molada, Hazar, Shul, Bala, Ezem, El, uh, El Tolad, Bethel, Horma. Horma is where Israel got chased the first time they went to try to take the land, and they, the Canaanites chased them and beat them all the way back to Horma, which means destruction. Uh, so this is way down south. This is desert area. Um, Beth, Marco, both, Hazar, Susa, Beth, Leboth, Sharhen, 13 towns in their villages, Ayan, Rim, and Ether, Ashan, four towns in their villages, all the villages around them, these towns as far as Baalath, Ba'er, Ramah, and the Negev. Again, this doesn't mean anything, but here's the key. <clears throat> this was the inheritance of the tribe of the Simeonites, clan by clan. The inheritance of the Simeonites was taken from the share of Judah because Judah's portion was more than they needed. So the Simeonites received their inheritance within the territory of Judah. So you turn to a, your map in your Bible, you'll see that Simeon is just this nev, like amorphous blob within the giant territory of Judah. One of the reasons it says is Judah was they didn't they, Judah had more land than they needed, and so God appointed Simeon to have land within Judah. But another reason, and this gets missed a lot, way back in Genesis 49 way back when Jacob 
was dying and he was pronouncing his blessing over all of his sons who would be the heads of the tribes. Two of the sons didn't receive blessings. They received curses because of violence that they had done at a place called Shechem where they had tricked the community and deceived them into entering into the community of Israel through marriage but they said they had to be circumcised in order to do so. And then when the men said, yes, we'll do it. We'll circumcise ourselves to enter in. Then while they were healing from their circumcision, Simeon and Levi went and massacred all of them. And those of you that were with us back in Genesis, you remember the story, the massacre at Shechem. So on his deathbed, when Jacob was giving his kind of speaking into being the future, he says, specifically in Genesis 49, Levi and Simeon, will be scattered throughout Israel. They will not, it's just a random line. They will be scattered throughout Israel. And what we see is that actually happens. Now Levi, the Levites redeem themselves. At the golden calf incident, they're one of the faithful tribes. That when, when Moses said, who's on the Lord's side and who's on the side of Baal? They actually come over to the Lord's side and so they're elevated. And then in Deuteronomy, they're told, Yeah, you're going to be scattered throughout the land, but because of your faithfulness at the incident of the golden calf, you, your scattering will be at the service of the Lord. Whereas the Simeonites, their scattering was just scattering throughout the land. So it's very interesting, but it explains why, if you've always wondered on your maps in the Bible, why is Simeon surrounded? Why does it not have its own land? Why is it in Judah? (coughs) It can trace it all the way back to this patriarchal promise of, Joseph, of Jacob to his son, speaking over them the future that he was seeing and, and, and how it has, it's all intertwined with Israel's story. So even the tribes themselves, there's this sense of corporate solidarity where the tribes have kind of trajectories that they're set on. And another tribe, let me skip because we don't have enough time, to read through all these list names, but they all read the same. The next amount, uh, allotment is for Zebulun, and then after that's Issachar, and then after that's Asher over on the coast up north, then Naphtali, and then the allotment for Dan, the last tribe, Dan. Verse 40, the seventh lot came out for the tribe of Dan, clan by clan. Their territory of their inheritance included Zorah, Eshtaol, Ir Shemesh, Sha'alabim, uh, Ajalon, Ithla, Elon, Timna, Ekron, Alteca, Gibbethon, uh, Belath, Jehud, Bnei Barak, Gathrimon, Mejarkon, Rakon, and the area facing Joppa. Verse 47. Now, after that litany of names, it means nothing to you. But the Danites had difficulty taking possession of their territory. So they went up and attacked Leshem, took it, put it to the sword, and occupied it. They settled in Leshem and named it, in Dan, named it Dan after their forefather. These towns and their villages were the inheritance of the tribe of clan, uh, Dan, clan by clan. So Dan, for whatever reason, was not, did not take their land. They had difficulty. The text doesn't really say why. So they decided to go up north. So the tribe of Dan, actually, instead of taking the lot that was given to them by God, they went up north. That's why the phrase later in the Bible, from Dan to Beersheba is like what we'd say from the Atlantic to the Pacific. It means all of Israel. Dan, way up in the north. And Beersheba, way down in the south. But Dan is a tribe, because of this, this story is going to get told in Judges chapter 18. This, this account will be told in Judges chapter 18. And what you're going to see is very interesting. Later, Dan almost fades entirely from Israel's history. And even in the book of Revelation, when it lists 144,000, it's using the tribes of Israel as this paradigm for all of God's people that are faithful, faithful martyrs. Um, it, it leaves out Dan. Dan's not in the tribal list. So there's this, this the, the Dan as a tribe is ambiguous in Scripture and tied into idolatry and compromise and not entering into the fullness of God. And so Dan slips away in biblical time. Look, look throughout the rest of Scripture and just watch, see the trajectory of the Danites. But it's kind of a downward spiral. So it's very interesting. You know, we like to think of the whole tribes of Israel and everything's parceled off nice and neat. And you've got the boundaries and you've got the borders and you've got this and you've got that. But it's much more ambiguous. It's, much, it's a little messier 
than what we're used to. So we end. The division of the land ends now. Verse 49, when they had finished dividing the land and its allotted portions, the Israelites gave Joshua, son of Nun, an inheritance among them. As the Lord had commanded, they gave him the town he asked for, Timnath Sarah, on the hill, in the hill country of Ephraim. And he built up the town and settled there. These are the territories that Eleazar the priest, Joshua son of Nun, and the heads of the tribal clans of Israel assigned by Lot at Shiloh in the presence of the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And so they finished dividing the land. So now the land has been divided. The inheritance has been given. The tribes, for varying degrees of success, have moved into their land. And here's the key. The last one to get his inheritance is the guy who the book's named after. This flies in the face of everything we know about the ancient Near East. In the ancient Near East, the warlord, the general, the, the king, the ruler, they get first dibs. They get the best of the land. They get what they want. And they give the rest. In Joshua, God gives the land. Because it's God's land. It's not Joshua's land and it's not Israel's land. It's never been anyone's land but God's. God gives the land. God divides the land up. The last person to receive his inheritance is Joshua. That is such a mark of servant leadership. Because Joshua 2.0, what's he going to say? thousand years later, 2,000 years later almost. Uh, about 1,400 years later, give or take. What's the next Joshua going to tell his followers? Those who will to be first will be last. The last will be first. Servant leadership modeled by Joshua ultimately modeled by Yeshua. But I love that. I love that. I, can I tell you a pet peeve of mine with churches? I'm going to tell you anyway because this is my study. My pastor always says that. Can I tell you? Well, I'm going to tell you because I'm preaching. I hate when I go to churches. Now, I don't, I'm not judging the, the people. I'm just saying the practice, the concept. This irks me. Unless it's in a packed, dense, urban area, I hate when I see pastor's parking signs. Or even worse, first lady parking signs. Because I grew up, my dad's a preacher, and every Sunday he drove to the church and drove to the farthest spot in the parking lot. And that's a big parking lot. And that's where he parked. He did that because why? Because he knew that servant leadership, that's what pastor means as servant. And if he parks in the front space, that's one less space for a potential visitor that could be coming to church that day. Or one less space for somebody who's running late and needs a spot and can't find one, they decide to go home. Just, just the concept of thinking about that. But it's so foreign to many churches. Because church, in many churches, I'm not beating up the church. I go to a large church. And large churches can do amazing things and small churches can do horrible things. So it's not about size. It's not about denomination. But just the practice that permeates. You see it in large churches. You see it in small churches. The practice of elevating leaders to the point of celebrities and then treating them like the celebrities are treated in the world, or CEOs, or any of those other things, is totally antithetical to the Gospel of Jesus, and as we see here, to the Gospel of Joshua. So, if you go to a church, and they do have, the pastor has his own parking space, you can keep going to church there. I'm not blasting the church. What I'm saying is, just know that's a blind spot. Just know that that's something that, you know, maybe that... Pa and, and usually it's not even the pastor doing it. I know of preachers in Methodist churches. I'm Methodist. We get, they get moved around church to church. And they come to churches and they arrive at a church that already has a pastor parking spot. But all the Methodist pastors that I know that I really love, the first thing they do when they get there is take that thing down. Because that's saying something. It's saying, this is the kind of leader I intend to be. So little things, you know, little things like that speak to it. And Joshua, I love that it, this chapter ends that way. Joshua completely 
does away with this whole cult of personality. And Yes, he's a leader. Yes, he's important. Yes, he's upheld. But he's the last one. He makes sure that everybody's got theirs before he gets his. And that's a mark of a leader. The boss is the one who gets his first and then everybody else. God doesn't want bosses. He wants leaders. And so we, in that we see that in Joshua. Alright, we're two minutes over, but we started two minutes late, so we're perfectly even. You guys have a great week. Uh, we'll see you next week. We're, all, we're, we're on the close. And there's only 20, Joshua only goes to 24. So we've only got four more chapters to go. Um, that's it. Have seconds. There's plenty left. Otherwise, we'll see you next week.